Matthew 9, 27 through 31. And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was come into the house, the blind men came unto him. And Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? And they said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith be it unto you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. But they, when they were departed, spread abroad his fame in all that country. So if you were listening carefully to the exhortation this morning, you're going to hear a lot of themes coming out of our Sunday school class today, um, dealing with the blind men, the two blind men. Um, and we're really focusing in on Matthew 9, 27 through 31, uh, because uh, there's actually a, a theme being established um, from the healing of Jairus' daughter on through, uh, in two weeks, the class Brother Roger is going to give on um, the healing of the follows the blind man um but we're just going to focus in on this this healing and maybe think about some things we haven't we haven't thought about very uh i'm sure we've thought about it in our in our past but haven't really um thought about in a while maybe we have i don't know i have obviously because they're on the class i'm giving you a class um so just want to back up a little bit. Um, Matthew, the, the healing of Jairus' daughter, um, again, just to springboard off, to, to try and establish that theme that, um, that Brother Roger will be bringing out. Um, it talks about the maid arising, the fame thereof went abroad into all that land. And if you talk of, if the focus of that land, uh, that, that went in the, the fame went abroad into that land, and that's sort of the underlying theme. Again, not to, not to give too much away, but it's, you've, you've probably heard it in the reading as well. The blind men were told, don't say anything, but they did. And again, it says country in the uh, reading we had this morning. That's that same Greek word for land. Um, but again, you're gonna, we're going to look at that in two weeks. Next week, Steve's up, but then we're going to come back to, uh, to this in two weeks. So... Um, so just fast forward through. We're on Matthew 9, 27. So Jesus departed thence. Okay, now there's, a, there's an idea here. When Jesus departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. Um, there's other times that we have this idea of Jesus departing. That's a, there's the same Greek word for passed by. If you think of um, Simon the Cyrenian, he was passing by. He was going one direction, and as an encounter with the Lord, with Jesus, he was turned around and compelled to carry that cross and follow the other way. So he was passing by. Simon the Cyrenian was passing by, and he turns around and goes the other way. But more interesting than that is um, in John 8, where they took up stones to cast at Jesus, where Jesus, they were going to stone Jesus. It was uh, one of the encounters he had with the, with the uh, leaders of Israel. They took up stones to cast at him. If you have your fingers warmed up, I recommend that you flip these passages up in the Bible and, and look at it for yourself, because there's nothing more powerful than than seeing it with your own eyes. And you can sort of see the context of what I'm talking about. Um, so if you have your fingers warmed up, get to John 8. It's the end of John 8. This is um, one of the many sections in Scripture where the chapter breaks don't help. Um, because chapter 8, verse 59 says, They took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. That same word. He passed by. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. So this passing by the blind man, there's a theme going on here. Okay, and we want to compare that with Matthew 20. Jesus passed by. He departed. So let's look over at Matthew 20. I think this is going to come up in the future. I think it's actually a, a class um, 
another class Brother Roger is going to do way down in the future, um, Matthew 20. If I remember the schedule, if I looked at it right. Um, but Matthew 20. It's this theme that's established with the passing by. <clears throat> Matthew 20, um, let's see. Um, verse 30. Yep, exactly. So he, this was um, at Jericho, verse 29, multitude followed him. Again, you have a multitude following him. Behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside when they heard that Jesus passed by. There's that phrase again. Two blind men, Jesus passing by, this time out of Jericho, cried out saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. It's crying the same exact thing. Two blind men, Jesus passing by, and they cry out the same thing. O Lord, thou son of David, have mercy on us. And the multitude rebuked them because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more saying, Have mercy on us. O Lord, thou son of David. Again, we're going to focus on that in a little bit, if I can get rolling here. Jesus stood by, stood, Jesus stood still and called them that they should come unto him. And what will you that I should do unto you? They say unto him, that our eyes may be opened. Jesus had compassion on them, touched their eyes immediately, their eyesight was followed. Again, I don't want to steal too much from that record because we're going to have that in the future, but there's definite parallels going on here that I just wanted to bring to your attention. Jesus passing by, Jesus does not make accommodation for these blind men, right? He doesn't say, oh, you're blind, let me come to you. In neither case, Jesus passes by, Jesus is on a mission, it's up to the blind to find their way to him. In our record this morning, he goes into a house, and when he's in the house, they come to him. And in this record in Jericho, again, he stands still, they have to come to him. And so there's a theme there that I just wanted to bring to your attention with that passing by. And he healed the blind man. And it's interesting that that record I had mentioned about in John 8, when they were casting stones at him, the context of that is the fact that he healed a blind man, a man that was born blind at birth. There's these themes going across these three stories, I'm trying to just plant the seeds. I'm not going to give you everything and expound it the way that uh, you probably would like, but I just want to plant those seeds that you'd say, there's something there that we need to think about, um, how Jesus, what's, what's being told us. Um, and it's that healing of that man born blind at birth. That healing actually kicks off the firestorm that is to be the end of his ministry. Okay? So here we are at the very early stages of his ministry. Again, not to um, give away our class in two weeks, but he's establishing the beginning of, a, of a, his ministry where he's healing people and he's making events happen. Then at the end, so we have the healing of a blind, two blind men, at the end, you have the healing of the man born blind from birth that actually kicks off the end of his ministry. So that being said, what I want to do right now is, is just consider some things um, in our natural world that maybe we take for granted every day and sort of think about what does it mean to be blind? What does it mean to see? I mean, every one of us has eyes in our ear. <laughs> Brother Rogers had surgery to help his eyes work better. Um, we have these in our face. They have these two little things in our skull, and we just we take it for granted so much of the time. Um, so I just want to go and think about the eye, and think about the complexity of the eye. Because this is one of the tools that Brother Roberts actually uses. If you ever read the book, um, "Is There a God?" where he, he's he's debating the creation versus evolution very early in that book. Um, he uses the eye and its complexity for. Um, to reinforce that we are created. This didn't just happen. Um, and as we sit here, we just want to take some time and consider how complex those little things are in, in, that you have in your face that you're using right now to look at me. Um, how complex that system is. Because um, you have these two blind men. And just some scripture, he that the, for the eye, he that formed the eye, shall he not see? 
So that's telling us right off the bat, the creator, the eternal creator of heaven and earth sees. He has the ability to see. So it's not something we should just take for granted. And I'm sure if, if we get stuck in the eye, we do not take it for granted. But we use it so much. It's so familiar with us, to us. I know I can speak for myself. That you don't think about it all the time. How much your eye, what your eye is doing. And there's many systems to the eye. And I'm just going to go through a few of the systems related to that eye that we, that we know about. One of them being the eye socket. The placement of the eye inside of a skull where it's fully protected by this bone all around it. I mean, that, that's not just chance. I mean, you look at a frog and its eyes are on top of its head. Not very protected. A frog doesn't even blink. I mean, not a frog, a fish, right? But you look at our eyes and their placement inside of a skull. It's, it's designed for protection. This, this organ, this member of our body is is set in a place in the body where it's adequately protected by this bone. So that's one thing to think about. The other thing is the eyelid. So you have these eyelids, which are interesting because just think about the job that your eyelid does. I mean, it's involuntary, right? Somebody throws something, a fly flies at your eye, you blink like that. It's, it's, the reaction time is, is astounding. Um, average duration for a single blink of the human eye is 0.1 to 0.4 seconds, or 100 to 400 milliseconds, according to the Harvard databases of useful biological numbers, whoever they are. But for purposes of comparison, um, the tick sound that you hear on a clock lasts for about a second. So say you hear a second, it would be possible to blink three times in a second. That's how fast your eyelids can move. And what's the job of that eyelid? Okay, You can close it. You can go to sleep. It blocks light. It's sufficient to block light. It can protect the eye. Again, it's another form of protection. Right? And it store, it's a store. It's like a built-in store. The, the, where do they go when they're open? They're stored perfectly out of the way, but ready for use in the blink of an eye, right? Right. So it's just amazing. I mean, this, this, little, this little aspect of the eye has this eye. What's another job? To, to spread the moisture, right? If our eyes were dry, they wouldn't work. If our eyes were too moist, that'd be annoying, but they wouldn't work as well. You have fish eye lens, you'd, you'd have to constantly be wiping your, but your eyelid provides adequate moisture, but you also have all these little, these glands around your eye to supply that moisture for your eye. It's just, you can't, it's perfect the way it was designed. And it cleanses the lens. You think, of, I don't have glasses, but I wear sunglasses sometimes. It's annoying. You have to take your glasses off, clean them, your eye, like that. The moisture of the eye is, is it works as designed. And you have all of these different layers to, um, to, to protect that eye. But more than that, what is it cleaning? It's cleaning the lens, right? So you have these lenses in your eye. And of course, as we get older, the lens doesn't focus like it should, but it certainly does better than having to manually adjust and focus your eyes to see things. Right? And you think about the way an insect's eye works. It has all these, all these lenses all over it. Imagine what we, you know, you see everywhere at once, but you don't see anything perfectly. I can't say that for sure. I'm not a bug. But you think about the way an insect's eye works. It's built very simply to detect movement and, you know, and it initiates that flight response when it sees movement. But the way our lens works to enable us, even with one eye, we can see depth because of our focus. Something's near, it's in focus, the things behind it are not in focus. So that the way that lens works in the eye to enable you to focus, it's just absolutely, there's a, so that's called our monocular field of depth, right? 
Um, and as we see things far away, the mountains and the, on the ridges, they're out of, the, you lose detail, right? Things that are close, you can really see the detail. So that lens enables us. And it's in the eye, it's, it, it works perfectly as designed. Reflecting, reflecting or whatever it does to the light so it hits the retina in the back of your eye just at the right spot. So that's the focus. But more than that, with the focus, you also have this idea of resolution, right? You, you have like uh, today's technology, you have cameras that say um, this many megapixels or you get a display screen, it's this much resolution. But what's the resolution of the human eye? And that's tricky to measure because our highest um, area of resolution, if you hold your thumbnail out in front of you, the size of your thumbnail is where your resolution is. Everything outside of that, your resolution, resolution drops drastically. Okay, So what that means is our resolution is enhanced by time. Okay, So the fact that time is marching on and we're moving our eyes around, which should be making your eyes go weird on the, I don't know if it works in the in the overhead, but it certainly works on the computer screen where those images, they wig out your brain because your eyes are moving. And that movement of the eye changes what you see. So your resolution, the resolution of the human eye is based intensely on time. The passage of time increases resolution because what you're focused on is what you're focused on. And so much so that you're you don't realize it, but you're constantly seeing your own nose. But your brain says, I don't need to know about my nose right now, so it's not focused on your nose. But it's always there, right? Your eye, it, it sends a signal to the brain that says, this is what you need to look at, no, 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 and it's constantly moving. So the speed of that eye enables us to perceive a high resolution. Whereas a screen, they say it's this much resolution. Well, that's because it has to be prepared to show full resolution across its whole field of um, depth because it doesn't know where you're going to be looking at any given time. So that's an interesting way to think about the resolution of the eye. Um, so that's, the, uh, that's your resolution of your eye. Um, but that enables us to perceive things, right? Our depth perception. Now, the fact that we have two eyes and they're about... I don't know, two, two and a half inches apart in our, in our heads, enables us to see another form of depth perception. Um, if you only have one eye, it's very hard to pour a cup of coffee into, if you at arm's length, you can see the lady doing that on the screen, hopefully. Um, it's very hard to see, to judge depth perception, but the fact that your two eyes are giving you two different signals at the same time that are slightly different, that your brain can then interpret into a depth, a position, it's, 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 and, he, and you think about the judgment, right? You think of um, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, you know, in a sense you have that principle right in your face. Two, two witnesses enable you to judge a matter properly, okay? So you can judge where something is because you have two witnesses. Um, just a, a living, sort of a living parable to think about. It gives us a depth of perception. And think about this, the muscles in the eye. These are, this is a diagram of all the different muscles that enable you to move those little orbs in your skull without having to move your neck, right? Imagine if you could only, if you had to move your neck to see anything, it would be extremely inconvenient, right? But those, those eye muscles, and you have two on the top, two on the side, and then, then the fact that they're synchronized together so that when you point them one way or the other way, they're synchronized. And again, depending on how far something is and how near something is, they can bring, come together or apart. It's just absolute, the, it's not chance. This stuff is really well designed, which we, we would expect no less from the creator of the universe. And they're lightning fast. We don't even think about it. You wanna see something, you're looking at it. You don't say, oh, I wanna look at my wife. Let me, let me move my eyes there. You know, no, it just, don't, 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 done. Amazing. 
And we just take these things for granted because we do it constantly and constantly. It's like you don't open the hood of a car and say, wow, that was neat. That happened by chance that I have an engine in there. No, it's designed. It's designed perfectly. And it's so complex, absolutely complex, how they all have to work together. More than that, there's a saying, I think it was Shakespeare that said, the eyes are the window of the soul. Um, but the theme is in, it's in scripture. Uh, Jesus mentions it, um, which we'll get to, I think. I don't have it on my screen, so I'm assuming I'm going to get to it in a minute. But the eyes, while they're taking in the signal, they're also providing signals to our fellow human beings. Whether we're sad, you can see it in someone's eyes when they're sad. Whether they're vacant, blank stared, or angry. I don't know. What is Obama there? We, we sort of, you can get sort of both vibes from that, right? And Eden, I don't know, she just has the best smiley eyes. I'm sort of biased. She's my daughter. But I think her smiles light. Her eyes just light up when she smiles. Um, but that emotion is displayed through what our eyes are conveying to others. So they do more than just take in a signal, like bug eyes, and just let our brain. They actually convey a response to other people. That's why when, when boys are young, they're taught shake hands and look at people in the eye. Look at one another in the eye. Because you're conveying an unspoken message to other people through our eyes. People who are shifting and avoid eye stare, looking at people in the eye, that you don't trust them. People who are confident enough to look at you in the eye, that there's an, a relationship that gets established, an unspoken relationship that's established. And that's how you tell if somebody's lying. You look at their eyes. What are they doing? Are they shifting? You can actually tell if they look up and right, whether they're making up a story, down and left, whether they're thinking of, I probably have the positions wrong, but depending, because there's different regions of the brain that make, uh, that establish either emotion, like you're trying to remember something, you're digging into the memory, it's over there. You're trying to make up some story that's plausible, well, you might look over there in your imagination. But it's really interesting how to spot a liar. Um, it's in their eyes. But the eye, So that's another thing that happens. But think about the beginning of time. Like in the beginning, what was, the, what was created on the first day? Right, I sort of gave you the answer. Let there be light. Right? Why? At light, these waves flying through the air, bouncing into our retinas right now, was created on day one. Before that, there was no light. Well, not that we can understand, not in a way that we can understand it. And that gets in sort of a you talk about pre creation, you get into some philosophical debates of what was and what wasn't. But what we do know let there be light. The usage of light was established day one. And you think about the, the philosophy that, uh, or the, the uh, Einstein came up with this theory of relativity and everything is relative. And he uses the speed of light as the basis of time and space, basically. Um, so that light, day one, time and space was created in a way that we can understand it. And that's what these orbs on our face do. But they were created by a word, which gets into the hearing, which is a whole nother class that we could go on about the hearing. But that being said, the word came forth from God and it was done. The word created light that we now use our eyes to see, right? Um, Ecclesiastes 11 and 7. Truly the light is sweet and a pleasant thing, and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. That's Ecclesiastes 11 and 7, an observation of Solomon. Truly the light is sweet. So in a sense, what we have in our eyes is a time machine because what we're doing is traveling through time. We're perceiving the passage of light and time is relative to light, okay? So our eyes are enabling us to move forward through time or perceive the passage of time. So you can think of your eyes as little time machines. We don't have much control over what they're receiving, but it enables us to perceive that time is passing. 
And we are on our way from day one. Let there be light. Time was established. And here we are 6,000 years later. Time marching on. God's word will not return to him void. So again, back to Ecclesiastes. The light is sweet. It's a pleasant thing for the eyes to behold the sun. Think about Ecclesiastes 1 verse 8. The eye is not satisfied with seeing nor the ear with hearing. The eye is not satisfied with seeing. Why do you think that is? We, our eyes never get full, like, oh, I've seen enough. I've got I to stop putting stuff in. Because they were created for something much more. They were created by the Father for eternity. They were created for much, to see much greater things than what they see now. So again, those words began everything that we know. Everything that we know right now, everything that we perceive right now was, was created in those words, let there be light. Because that's what we perceive. So again, just to bring all, those sin, all of those faculties together, right? In a sense, those orbs in your skull, they are just sensing light. But it's up to that gray matter, that mushy stuff between your ears, to make sense of it. Okay? So that mushy stuff is saying, I'm seeing these light signals. Your eyes, your eyes get bombarded with light. It translates it into an electronic signal, sends it down the optic nerve, and your brain says, that's my mom. You know? and, and, and just the translation between that signal and perceiving, so our eyes sense our mom, but our brain perceives our mom. And there's deficiencies, right, where people have brain damage and they don't recognize faces, things like that. But for the most part, your eyes give, many, on this picture, four different signal, signals um, to your brain. And your brain makes sense out of depth, out of color. Some are color deficient, but our brains make sense out of it because that's, that's what they do. Our eyes just send the signal. And God is very interested in what's going on in that gray, mushy stuff between your ears. He is. He created it. And he wants something. Right? And that's sort of, that, that is, the, in a nutshell, the point of this class. Just to remind ourselves of that fact. He is very interested in that. And that's just the sight. Then you throw on there the hearing. So your eyes are stimulated by vibrating light. Your ears are stimulated by vibrating sound. Your touch is stimulated by vibration. If you feel stuff, it's also chemical. If you pour gasoline on your hand, you'll feel it. I don't know if you've ever done that. But, you put, it's chemical, but there's chemical signals going to your brain. You taste, that's a chemical reaction. Right? You smell things, those are the particles going up into your nose and chemically interacting and that part of your brain is right next to your, where your memories are. That's why when you smell things, it brings back memories really fast. Because those two parts, that, that sense is right next to your brain, is in the same location in your brain. Um, but God designed these things. God designed us to, be, to receive stimulation and react. And he's interested, again, what's going on between those ears. Right? And all of these senses are coming in. And our brain says, ignore the nose in the way right now. Ignore this. Ignore that. That's why if you have a little baby and the baby's crying, you're hyper, and it's a new baby, you're hypersensitive to that baby. But a train could go flying by. You'll never notice it. Because your brain knows how to focus. Right? Your brain makes sense of those, those many, many complex signals that you receive. Right? right now, you're not, you weren't thinking about your foot until I just mentioned it. But now you're thinking about the position of your foot in your shoe, if you're wearing shoes. You know? Now you're thinking about it. That's, it's just amazing the way God designed this to work and the way it works perfectly. And he's, again, super interested in this. Okay? Bring this back to the two blind men who were healed. Right? Christ's healings were absolutely complete. He didn't say, oh, I know what's wrong with you. You have a cataract. Let me fix your lens. No, he, he healed people 
and they understood what they saw. In fact, and fast forward to another story, I see men walking as trees, you know, or the man born blind. His brain never received these signals. Now he can actually interpret the signals. So he who created the eye, shall he not see? His healings, the things that he can heal, the things that we, we put our faith that he is in God, that he is able to do, he's able to do perfectly. He knows. Right? Those chemical synapses going on between our ears. He knows how that all works. And he knows what he wants to be happening there. But he also created a free will that enables us to put whatever we want in front of these senses, in front of our eyes, in, in our ears. Right? He wants his word. And that's our choice. That's where free will comes in. Again, so healing. The healing is absolutely complete. When Christ healed someone... It was absolutely complete. So just to, just, to remember, just to remind us, that picture is just the complexity of what you have going on right now in your head with those eyes. And it was all created and designed that way by a word. So now what I want to do in the time we have remaining is think about stories in the Bible related to the eye. Once you, I thought it would be sort of interesting, you know, to just go through all of the stories related to eyes. But then as I sat there and started going through it, I said, I got to put the brakes on this because I'm going to be here for weeks and weeks going through all these Bible stories. But one of them's super powerful. Hopefully I can convey how powerful it is. But before we get to that story, I just want to start at the beginning. Remember Adam and Eve, right? They were created, the first ones that were created. And what does it say about them? Well, what does the serpent say to them? The serpent says, and if you, again, if you want to flip your Bibles open, Genesis 3, right at the beginning, Genesis 3, verses 2 through 7. We see this. The serpent said unto the woman, verse 5, uh, yeah, verse 4. The serpent said unto the woman, he shall not surely die. The first lie of the Bible. For God doth know in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. Ye shall be as God, knowing good and evil. Now, was that a lie? No, uh, no. Well, again, think about Eve, right? These things were pleasant to her eyes, right? It's one of the, one of the temptations, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, pride of life. These things were pleasant to her eyes. So there's the eyes, an int integral part of the fall of Eve. And then, but look at verse 7. And the eyes of them both were open. So the serpent was right in that regard anyway. Their eyes were open. They knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So right at the beginning, you have this organ in man and woman playing an integral part, right? Their eyes were opened. Okay, let's go on to the next example. Lot and Abraham. If you remember, Lot lifted up his eyes. He lifted up his eyes, and what did he look at? Anybody? What did he see? Well-watered plain. Yeah, well-watered plain. Sodom, right? He lifted up his eyes, and he said, yeah, that's where I want to be, down there. Right after that, what happens with Abraham? He lifted up his eyes, and he was told, look from the place where you are, north south, east, and west. Use your eyes, Abram. Look at this. And he gives them a great promise. These things are promised to you. Perceive them with your eyes, Abram. Perceive them. Think about them. And again, we have in, verse, in Genesis 18, verse 2, lo, three men stood by him. So he looked up, he lifted up his eyes, and he saw these three angels coming. We're just going to skip over that. But again, it's Abram using his eyes to perceive the will of God. That's, that's the basic principle. The sacrifice of Isaac. He saw the place afar off. He lifted up his eyes. This is Genesis 22, verse 4. If you flip, flip your Bible over. Genesis 22, verse 4. He saw the place afar off. Three days journey. Again, looking at his eyes. Using his eyes for the will of God. Sacrifice your son, your only begotten son. And he lifted up his eyes in verse 13. Behold, behind him a ram caught by his horns, in the thicket by his horns. 
So here's Abram. So the eyes are, again, integral in Abraham's, Abraham's walk in faith. Think about Isaac and Jacob. This one's sort of interesting. Isaac, when he was old, this is Genesis 27, verse 1. When he was old, his eyes were dim so that he could not see. That's no surprise, right? But why are we told that? Isaac was old and his eyes were dim that he could not see. What else does eyes being dim mean, right? But look at his son, Jacob. And this is uh, Genesis 48, verse 10. Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age so that he could not see. So you have these two men, father and son, both had dim eyes in their old age. But look at what Hebrews 11 says. Hebrews 11 brings these two accounts together. These two accounts are brought together by Hebrews in the chapter on faith. At this point, when the scripture is clear, Genesis 27, his eyes were dim for age. Genesis 48, Jacob's, Israel's eyes were dim for age. Hebrews 11 says, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning the things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped leaning upon the top of his staff. And both of those instances that Hebrews is pulling out, the Old Testament scripture reminds us that they were not, their eyes were dim for age. And if you think hard enough about it, you'll, you'll think of a principle. But I'm not going to tip my hand just yet on that one. So that's Isaac and Jacob brought together at that point in their life in Hebrews 11. Now this is where it sort of gets interesting with uh, Balaam, the son of um, Beor. Numbers 22, if you want to flip that over, Numbers 22, uh, remember the, uh, the donkey, Balaam's donkey spoke to him. Um, the donkey saw something that Balaam didn't see so that the eyes of Balaam had to be opened says Genesis, uh, Numbers 22 verse 31 the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam so Balaam lifted up his eyes and he saw Israel Numbers 24 verse 2 and look at what how he refers to himself after that Numbers uh, 24 verses 2 and verse 15 do you see how he refers to himself there The man whose eyes are opened. The Lord opened his eyes. His eyes were opened. Balaam saw. What did he see? Verse 4. Numbers 24, verse 4. He saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, but having his eyes opened. What is this emphasis over and over about Balaam's eyes being opened? There's a principle being taught to us here about the use of eyes. What's the result of this? Numbers 25, verse 6. These, these, what's the result of Balaam's work? Right? What did he, he couldn't curse them. He couldn't have God curse them. So what does he do? We learn that he says, here's how you get Israel to fall. The only way they're going to fall is if they sin with the world, in a sense. And so the result, Numbers 25, verse 6, a Midianitish woman, where? In the sight of Moses, before his eyes. They're so blatant in their sin that they bring this woman that they're about to sin with into the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation. And this theme right here, this event right here, kicks off a theme with Moses, with what Moses um, exhorts the congregation to do. Think about what they were supposed to have, right? In the, in the borders of their garment, a fringe of blue, look at to remember the commandments of Yahweh to do them, that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which you use to go a whoring. Right? Wear that blue in your eyes, in your sight, so that you will remember the commandments of Yahweh. 
Seek not after your own heart, after your own eyes, which you use to go whoring. Right? And that's what they did. Balaam said, bring these women in. That'll fix them. I can't curse them, but I'll tell you how to, how to ruin them. Put these ladies in front of their eyes. Because they use their eyes to go whoring. They're supposed to walk in blue. Look up 2 Peter. We've got to look this one up. 2 Peter 2. 14. This is Peter's comment on this. 2 Peter 2. Verse 14. Having eyes full of of adultery that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and heart. They have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumbass speaking with a man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. He's commenting on the fact that their eyes were full of adultery. They cannot cease from sin. And that's exactly what Moses tells them. Walk in bloom. Right? Watch out. You know, be careful, little eyes, what you see. That's a very serious song. Because <laughs> it's true. It's absolutely true. Um, and then think about, again, another, the last place we see Balaam come up, Revelation 2, 14. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. Stumbling blocks only work if you cast them in front of someone who's blind. And that's exactly what Balaam did. He blinded them. Right? He cast, he taught him to cast a stumbling block in front of them. Again, think about Moses, right? Moses and the children of Israel. And this, this theme will come up and come up again and again. In Deuteronomy, flip over to Deuteronomy. And I, I've never noticed this until I started looking at this theme of eyes. Your eyes have seen what Yahweh did because of Baal Peor. Your eyes have seen it. Your own eyes have seen this thing. And think about Moses. He was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. His eyes were clear. He could see. But Deuteronomy 3, 21, Moses commands Moses, Thine eyes have seen. Again, he's reminding him, remember, Joshua, what you saw with your eyes. You saw this. And again, what was Moses told to do? Lift up thine eyes, north, west, north, south, and east. This is chapter 2, verse 27. Lift up your eyes and behold it with your eyes. They'll inherit the lands which thou shalt see. Again, our eyes, are they focused on the promise? Moses' eyes were not dim. His eyes were focused on that promise that was to come. Behold it with your eyes. What else are you going to behold it with? But there's an emphasis here. It's an emphasis. Look up Deuteronomy 4, verse 3. Hopefully you're right in that area. Deuteronomy 4. That's what's quoted on the screen. Your eyes have seen what Yahweh did because of Baal Peor. Look down at verse 9. Take heed to thyself. Keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, but teach them to thy sons and to thy sons' sons. Those things that you saw, those principles, you are obligated to teach them to your children. Those things that your eyes saw. Verse 10, especially, especially that day that thou stoodest before Yahweh thy God in Horeb, when Yahweh said unto me, gather the people together and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days 
that they shall live upon the earth and that they may teach their children. Again, teach them to your children. Ye came near. You stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire unto the midst of heaven with darkness and clouds and thick darkness. And Yahweh spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. Ye heard the voice of words, but you saw no similitude. Only ye heard a voice. The emphasis there, what are you listening to, right? You didn't see there was darkness, there was a cloud, but you certainly heard a voice. Verse 12, and he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them upon two tables of stone. Why would you write them down? So that you can see them, right? You don't write something down so that you can listen to it. You don't write something down so that you can, well, I guess if you're blind, you write it in Braille, but... For the most part, the whole point is write them down so that you can see them and remember those things that you heard and teach them to your children, as they underline, right? <clears throat> so, um, so we're told, flip over to Deuteronomy 6. Hopefully you're still in Deuteronomy there. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 through 8. Here... O Israel, this is the greatest commandment, right? The greatest thing we can do is keep the commandments of God. We have to keep the commandments. The only way to keep them is to know them. We have to sense them and perceive them and know them, right? So here's the first and greatest commandment. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God is one Yahweh. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words, which I command thee this day, shall be in thy heart. And what are you supposed to do with them? Verse 7, thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand. Thou shalt be as frontlets, where? Between your eyes. He is very concerned with what's going on between your ears. Very concerned. When you sit down, this is what you talk about. When you walk, this is what you do. When you have kids, that's what you teach them. So that they can do the same. And they can do the same. Because that's the only way we're going to overcome. Because the world wants to fill our eyes with whatever garbage, whatever they want to fill it with. So again, in Deuteronomy 11, don't, don't turn this up, Exodus 13, 16. It shall be a token upon thine hand, frontlets between thy eyes, for by strength of hand Yahweh brought us out forth out of Egypt. And when your son asks you, again, teach them to your children. When your son asks you, this is what you say to them. And look at this in Deuteronomy 9, verse 17 talking about when he took the two stones. He came down and they were, they were sinning. He took the two tables of stones. Deuteronomy 9, 17. Took the two tables, cast them out of my two hands and break them before your two eyes. You saw it. He didn't, it doesn't just say they broke them before their eyes. You saw it with both of your eyes. Both your eyes saw this. You broke the commandments of God and they were broken before your two eyes. Right? So Deuteronomy 4.16 warned them against this. It warned them against the, the images of the land, the, the bad things that were happening in the land, the, the images that these people had. Why do people want images? So they can see it. These, behold, these be thy God. You can see it. I can trust that. Right? I have faith in that. I can see it. It looks like a cow and it's golden. Neat. I can trust that. No, you don't see God. You hear the voice of his words. His words, again, back, let there be light. His words are ultimately powerful. Should influence what we see, what we perceive. Right? So he broke them before, his two eye, before their two eyes because they weren't ready to see. Right? And just real quick, um, 
Deuteronomy, like I said, this is absolutely powerful. This, this whole section just pops out with, you can just, it's just amazing. The fact of what was done before their eyes, what they're supposed to do with their eyes. And that's really, if you think about the story all the way through Babylon. Anyway, Deuteronomy 13, verse 17 through 18, there shall cleave, and there shall cleave not of the cursed thing to thine hand that the Lord may turn from the fierceness of his anger and show thee mercy and have compassion on thee and multiply thee as he has sworn unto thy fathers. When thou shalt hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God to keep all his commandments, which I command thee this day to do that which, which is right in the eyes of Yahweh thy God. Do, right what, do that which is right in the eyes. Which brings us to the next story, which I'm sure I'm way over time. But, oh, man, I have so much more. Oh, <laughs> I apologize. But I'm just going to go lickety-split through these real quick, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, judges. What's the theme of the judges? Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Springing from what did Deuteronomy tell us? Do that which is right in God's eyes, right? And that, again, we'll have to blow through that. Think of Samson, right? He did, living in the time of judges, doing that which is right in thine own eyes. And what did he pray for? What did Samson pray for? Oh, Lord God, remember me. Why, do we, why, why are things written on those statements? So that we can see them, so that we can remember them, right? Remember me, Samson says, and strengthen me. I pray thee only this once, O oh God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines. Why? For my two eyes. Why did Samson want to be avenged for his two eyes? Because he had wasted his life looking at women, at whatever, at the, thing, the pleasures of the flesh. He had wasted his eyes in the world, and he wants to be avenged and say, my eyes should have been for you. And that's exactly the principle that we need. So again, Job, what does he say? I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think on, on a maid? Right? He made a covenant with his eyes. Again, we'll have to go through that. <clears throat> Matthew, you, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, Psalm 102, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Remember the cleaving of the hand? Uh, I have to leave that aside. But. And you think about Romans 13 and 2, not only that do the same, you know, those that commit such things are worthy of death, not only that do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. What are we setting before our eyes? Brothers and sisters, what are we setting before our eyes? I know what I want to set before my eyes, and it's not the right thing. I'm with Samson. I want to put godly things before my eyes. And that's what we need to resolve to do. That's the principle of Deuteronomy with those tables of stone. We need to put, get rid of those other things. We don't have time to talk about Eli and Zedekiah. The beginning, you know, Eli, he was... Again, dim for old age. But then Zedekiah had his eyes put out. His kids killed, his sons killed before him. His eyes put out. Can't look at that. Um, Jonathan, his eyes were brightened when he ate the honey. He was thinking, what is honey a symbol of? The land flowing with milk and honey. It's a symbol of the promise. Right? His eyes were brightened because of that. I tasted a little of this honey. If our, if our eyes are focused on the promises that God made, our eyes will be brighter. Right? Eye, eyes not full. Our eyes don't get full on this worldly stuff. Anyway, David, you have, um, don't look on his countenance. God doesn't see the way man sees. Um, then David was on, tarried in Jerusalem. He put the wrong thing before his eyes again. He looked at Bathsheba from the rooftop. Um, so where are we pointing our eyes? That's a question. Elisha from our exhortation this morning. He prays that his servant's eyes may be open. And what does he see? The, the angels, chariots of fire. Um, then you have Elisha leading the blind army. He prays that they're blind. Then he prays that their eyes are open again. It's a symbol of leading captivity captive through the power of prayer. Can't, can't spend any time there. And then Paul. I send thee, here's the commission of Paul, I send thee to open their eyes, the eyes of the Gentile, to turn them from darkness to light. That was Paul's commission. And how has that commission started? He was three days without sight. Don't have time to expand that. Um, 
have mercy on us. That's the call of the, um, of the, of the, the two blind men. Followed him crying, saying, Jesus, the son of David, have mercy on us. Mercy from what? One of the curses in Deuteronomy 28 is that, you know the, the story of the curses and the promises. Well, one of the curses in Deuteronomy 28, verse 65, the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart and failing of eyes. Here's these two blind men. They were in, they were in the land of Israel, but they had a failing of eyes. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on us. Relieve us from this curse we brought upon ourselves. Right? And the mercy of David. What's the mercy he showed to Saul? Right? Return, my son David, says Saul, for I will no more do thee harm, because my soul was precious in thine eyes. That's the mercy of David. It's related to eyes again. I don't have time to expand that. But it all boils down to faith. And that's the key where we're going to end up. Um, the Hebrew word, uh, Greek word is pistis. Do you have faith that I am able to do this, right? Then he touched their eyes, and I could go on another class on this idea, but we obviously I'm way over time. I apologize. But the th- you have to remember this. According to your faith, be it done to you. Do you have faith that I'm able to do this? That's what he's asking each and every one of us. Do you have faith that I'm able to do this? And they said, yea, Lord. And that's what we have to respond. Yes. Well, according to your faith, brethren and sisters, be it done unto you. Okay. I have to skip all this. It's hard to do, but I'm doing it. Um, The last thought I just want to leave with, because faith has all to do about resurrection, the humanly impossible. Right? Do we have faith that he's able to bring back the dead? According to your faith, be it done unto you. So I'm just going to leave on this point. Some may say, some have said to Christ, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? And what do we say? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible we shall be changed the stone which the builders reject refused has become the head of the corner this is the lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes and god shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death i have not seen nor ear heard. So that's where I'm going to have to leave it.